Okay, good morning, everybody. Let's uh, dive in. Any questions about assignments three, four, five, six? All good? Okay, so um, we are going to finish our discussion today on the tools uh, of the trade. We're gonna dive down into the engine room of a physics engine to see a little bit about what's going on under the hood of Pyrosim. We will finish that today, and then we will start in on our next uh, theme, which is the history of evolutionary robotics. Uh, the field is 23 years old, so not a lot of history. We'll go relatively quickly, and we'll touch on uh, the very first experiments at evolutionary robotics today. And then next week, we'll look at sort of two early branches in the history, one focused on minimal cognition, meaning what is the simplest body plan, the simplest neural controller, the simplest tasks we could start evolving our robots in, where they would start to exhibit the rudiments of intelligence, and then start to evolve them up from there, rather than what you often see in robotics, which is starting with a fantastically complex machine and training it on training data for weeks or months or years and hoping for the best. Start simple and gradually complexify things as you go. That is a early and continuing theme in evolutionary robotics. And towards the end of next week, we'll start to get into uh, locomotion. Why do we spend so much time in robotics thinking about how machines can move themselves from point A to point B? And what is the relationship between locomotion and intelligent behavior? Okay, so back to uh, physical simulation. We started this uh, discussion last time. You're obviously uh, building some assignments that are gradually going to build up an evolutionary algorithm that wraps around Pyrosim. And that evolutionary algorithm is using Pyrosim to create an empty simulator and gradually build up a robot, evaluate the fitness of that robot in Pyrosim. Pyrosim is a wrapper around Open Dynamics Engine, which is one of many physics engines that are out there. And when we designed Pyrosim, part of the goal of this was to sort of hide the details of physical simulation from you. So after today, we're going to go back to ignoring the details of physical simulation, but it is important to understand what's going on under the hood. And the main thing which we talked about last time is that every time step in a simulation, regardless of the physics engine that you're using, the physics engine knows the masses of all the objects that are in play in the virtual environment. It is computing all of the forces that are acting on each of those objects at that time step and computing from those forces and, uh, and those um, uh, the forces and the masses of those objects, it's computing the accelerations for each object. And the physics engine then uses those accelerations to update the new position and orientation of the objects. Right? At a very high level, that's basically what a physics engine is doing. We're going to walk through some of the code that makes up Open Dynamics Engine. Uh, Open Dynamics Engine is written not in Python. The semicolon should be a little bit of a hint to you. Anybody played around with Open Dynamics Engine or know what it's written in? It says written in C++. If you don't know C++, doesn't matter for our purposes today. We're just sort of looking at how ODE works. When in PyroSim you create a new variable called sim, when you create an empty simulator, it creates a world, which is what's going to hold all of the objects. We're going to, we'll talk about contact spaces uh, in a moment, which is all of the objects that cannot interpenetrate, which seems kind of odd. But if you think about it, uh, especially in your robotic simulation, at certain times you are taking multiple objects and connecting them together with a joint, and often those objects at, at the first time step are already interpenetrating, they're overlapping one another which is fine, so we're going to allow that to happen. But there are certain other objects, like an object's leg and the floor, that we do not want to interpenetrate. So uh, a physics engine needs to do a little bit of accounting about which objects are allowed to pass through one another's and which, uh, and which aren't. We also are going to maintain, or the physics engine is going to maintain a group 
which contains all of the objects that are currently in contact with one another. And we're going to, it's going to deal with that subset of objects differently. We can then already start to apply some forces to the objects, like gravity. So for all objects at every time step in the simulation, at least one force is always acting on those objects, which is pulling them down towards the ground. We can then specify other aspects of our simulation, like the friction properties uh, of the objects, and so on. Okay. Then, obviously, as you've already seen in the assignments, we can start to create uh, objects. In Open Dynamics Engine, it treats objects in a particular way which seems a little bit non-intuitive on the surface. Each object in the virtual world has two data structures associated with it, a body and a geometry. The body specifies all the physical properties of the object. And the geometry, as the name implies, is going to specify all the geometric or shape properties of the object. There's reasons why the physics engine wants to treat these differently, and we'll get to that in a moment. So when you send an object to, from PyroSim to ODE, for example, in this case we're creating a box, we can, under the hood, ODE specifies the distribution of mass within that object. That's a detail that's hidden by PyroSim. We're going to assume for every object you create in your physics engine, the mass inside of the object is uniform, just to keep things simple. We specify, uh, obviously, the, ma the total mass itself of the object. Um, and then finally, the initial position of the object. Right? And then from then on, the physics engine is going to start to alter that initial position. OK. You've already learned a little bit about uh, positions and orientations. So specifying the orientation of an object in three dimensions can be a little bit tricky because technically speaking, you need four numbers to do so. There's different ways to do that. The most common way to do this in uh, a physics engine is to use a quaternion. What a quaternion basically does is specify the orientation of an object in space by saying, take that object and align it so that its long axis lies along the following three-dimensional vector, which is x, y, z. So in the cartoon example here, I have a rectangular solid, and I am uh, aligning it along the vector x, y, z. And then the fourth number in the quaternion is an angle, which specifies how much that object should be rotated about that vector. For most of us, myself included, it's hard to think in quaternion space. So most of what you're going to be doing, actually all of what you're going to be doing in the assignments is building things either out of rectangular solids and cylinders. Whenever you use a rectangular solid, you are not going to, uh, you're not going to rotate it, because if you do, you need quaternions. Cylinders, you are going to be setting them at different orientations. You've already done this with your scissor bot. You have two cylinders that have different orientations. The nice thing about working with cylinders is they are obviously symmetric about their long axis. So we can forget about the fourth element in a quaternion and just specify three numbers, which is the vector along which we're going to align the long axis of the cylinder. Make sense? OK. What about objects that are spheres? Rota they're rotation invariant, right? It doesn't matter what the, the orientation is. OK. You can, uh, uh, so when you specify the orientation in PyroSim, we hide this fourth element uh, from you. And there's an actual call underneath in ODE, which says how to align that object along vector x1, y1, and z1. OK, so that's mass properties, position, and orientation. What about the geometry of the object itself? One of the other things that physics, the other important aspect that a physics engine does for you is not just compute forces and accelerations, but to deal with contact detection. What, hap what happens when a pair of objects comes into contact with one another? And contact resolution. What forces should be applied when those objects come into contact? It turns out that contact detection and resolution can become very complicated very quickly. So we're just going to touch on some of the, the basics of this. 
As I mentioned, the way that ODE handles this is that for every object you create, it creates a body data structure and also a geom, uh, a geom data structure, which you can think of as the skin that it's going to wrap around your object. In this case, we are uh, creating a box and we are wrapping a one by one by one box around uh, this object. You'll notice that there are no units here. One of the funny things about Open Dynamics Engine is that it's kind of unitless. Sometimes you'll see in the documentation uh, U standing for some just, just generic uh, unit. Doesn't, doesn't really matter. It could be one centimeter, one meter. For our purposes, it doesn't really matter. We're working in a virtual world. We then called, uh, or, or ODE then calls this line here, which, uh, which unites these two data structures. Each one points to the other, so we know that this combined uh, object specifies both the mass and the geometrical properties or the skin of this object. What is geom for? Well, as you can imagine, the, the uh, physics engine is going to use the geom to do collision detection and resolution. And it's going to use the body data structure to compute forces and derive accelerations for, for the object. OK, so how does the physics engine keep objects from colliding that should not collide? We can shoot two objects at one another. And when they meet, they should stop moving. And depending on their properties, they should either fall to the ground or bounce off one another depending on their physical properties. First thing we need to do, obviously, is compute the distance between each geometry pair, where pair is the most important word in this sentence. You can play around with this in PyroSim. You can start to send a whole bunch of objects to the physics engine. For most laptops, you can usually send about 100 or 200 objects to, you, to your virtual world before your laptop starts to complain and <laughs> crap out on you. If you start to connect uh, those objects together, things slow down. And especially if those 100 or 200 objects tend to be close to one another, you'll notice that your computer starts to do a lot more work. If you drop a whole bunch of objects and drop them so that they are widely spaced from one another in the physics engine, it usually runs quite quickly. The reason why is, again, this idea of contact detection. So for the physics engine to figure out which objects are in contact with one another, it has to look at every potential pair. Let's have a look at this cartoon example here, where imagine we're creating nine spheres in our physics engine. And at the moment, uh, we're placing them in two different contact spaces. You remember, if I back up a little bit to the initialization point here, I'm creating a variable called space. And space contains all of the objects that cannot interpenetrate. In this cartoon example here, I'm creating two spaces, one that contains four of the nine objects, and the second one contains the other five. Why would we want to do that? We'll see that in a moment. But in each space, the physics engine is going to compute whether these two objects are in contact, these two, these two, these two, or these two. Same thing over here. So for any space, if we have n objects in that space, how many collision detection events does the physics engine have to look at, have to consider? Sorry? Not quite. We're getting closer. The simplest thing is just ask it to do every pair. And if we have n objects, it's how many pairs do we have to look at? n times n minus 1 over 2. n times n minus 1 over 2, right? So if we look at every possible pair, it's n squared. But obviously, we don't need to ask if this object is in contact with this object, and then also ask whether this object is in contact with this object. Because if we look in one direction, and it is, they are in contact, obviously, the same is going to be true in the other one. So we can get away with n times n minus 1 over 2. right? For every n object here, there's the n, we have to look at the other n minus 1. 
and we can get rid of half of those. Okay, so in this cartoon example where we have two spaces, we have four objects in one and five in the other, how many total potential collision detection events does ODE need to consider? So we've got n equals four over here, which gives us how many events we need to consider? Four times three divided by two, six, right? I heard six out there. For space two, 10. Five times four divided by two is 10. Okay, right, so six events over here and 10 over here, 16, already more than the number of objects in the space. The limiting factor in ODE, the, the computational limit in ODE and most other physics engines is not the total number of objects in the space, but the total number of objects that can, can potentially collide with one another. For your purposes, for most of the assignments, this isn't going to matter. But in your final project, if you start to build a robot that, for example, is walking over ground littered with a whole bunch of objects and obstacles, this might start to matter. OK. So if it, yes, question. Is there a minimum distance that you should consider? Ah. So it gets tricky, right? So at, at the moment, we're at n times n minus 1 over 2. Can we do better? Right? It might be that two of the four objects in this space are a kilometer apart. And of course, why bother even considering that pair? But we still need to query the pair to know how far apart they are. Right? So it's, it actually, as I mentioned, it gets very tricky very quickly. And there are ways that you can actually work to try and make this more computationally efficient. There is a whole literature in computer graphics about exactly this question. That's a great point, right? So we don't need to actually look directly at every object to object. We do, it, we are looking at every object to object pair in the second example here where we just have a single space that contains all nine objects. In this potential situation down here, it's the same scene, it's the same initial scene up here, but we've just created one space and we've put all of our nine objects in that space. How much work have we now made for ODE? How many collision events does it need to consider? 9 times 8 divided by 2 is 36, right? 36 is much more than 16, which justifies these spaces. So as you mentioned, the computer uh, games community figured out very quickly, you don't need to consider every pair of objects. You can be a little clever and do this hierarchically. If you have groups of objects which are closer or further away, you can wrap, in turn, subsets of objects in spaces and do one collision detection at each time step, which is, is this space in contact with this space? If it is, unfortunately, you need to do all 36 collision detections. But if these two spaces are not in contact with one another, which is going to be true most of the time, if you choose your clusters wisely, you can get away with only looking at local collision events within individual spaces, which in this cartoon example, we can get away with doing only 16 so detections. So if an object from space two goes into space one, all of it gets combined, so they actually belong to the space and not individual objects themselves? An object can never travel from one space to another. It always belongs to that space. So as the objects start moving, or once the physics engine starts moving those objects, the space will deform to always contain its five objects. So you have now spaces that are moving, but unlike the objects, spaces can also alter their shape as the objects inside them are moving. So at the beginning of every time step in a simulator, where we have multiple contact spaces, we're first asking, are the spaces in contact? And then depending on the answer to that, we have to do more or less collision detection uh, events. 
There's a question out there. Yes. Yeah, but how does it after the business owner starts running the spaces expand because the objects are leaving and objects in particular spaces collide? Yep. So what happens if as you start up the, the simulation, these five objects start to move apart? and these four objects start to move apart, the two spaces become very large and they overlap, and they overlap for most of the simulation, for example, then you chose your two spaces unwisely, and ODE is gonna have to do more or less just as much work here as it would if you had created one space. So as you can imagine, things now get even more complicated, which is it's hard for a human to figure out what the spaces should be. So you can write some more intelligent code that recomputes spaces from one time step to the next. Imagine we have yet another algorithm which is trying to intelligently wrap spaces around subsets of close objects to reduce this number. Gets, gets very tricky, right? Okay, so, um, but on the surface, for our purposes, it's pretty straightforward. Look at pairs of objects, and if they are touching one another, or possibly interpenetrating one another, and we'll talk about how that can happen in a moment, what does the physics engine do? The simplest thing is to add two new forces, two new vectors, attach those two vectors to the colliding objects, and which direction do those forces push in? What's the direction of those force vectors? If we place those two vectors in the center of the colliding objects, do those two force vectors point toward one another, orthogonally to one another, away from one another? What would intuitively make sense here? Away. away, right? So these two objects have not only collided, but they have interpenetrated. So no, no. We're going to try and separate them, or ODE is going to separate them, not by adding some additional code and some additional control logic. We're just going to add additional forces that are pulling the objects away. And as we just discussed, those forces are going to alter the acceleration of these objects, which is hopefully to slow and stop the acceleration in this direction and increase acceleration in the opposite direction. At the same time as other forces are acting on these objects like gravity. So maybe they bounce into one another and as they're bouncing off, they're also arcing down towards the ground. Does OE handle um, deformation at all from elastic collisions? Good question. So does it handle deformation? And the answer is no. ODE and a bunch of early physics engines are what are known as rigid body simulators, which assumes that the geoms, the skins of the objects, never change. We'll talk uh, towards the end of the course about soft-bodied simulators, which are much more complicated, but they allow you to simulate rubber and plastic and silicone and frog cells, among other things. Okay, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, so uh, you've already encountered joints, uh, not too much additional that's going on under the hood. We use a joint to connect together pairs of objects. We need to tell the simulator where the joint is, which is usually at the same position where the objects overlap. Some of you may have noticed when you were coding up joints in your simulator that you may have put the position of the joint in the wrong place. Has anybody seen that? What happens to these two objects if you do not place the joint at the point at which they overlap? Exactly. So if I put, for example, the joint here rather than connect the correct position here, then the objects will rotate about this point rather than the obvious one, which would be where they're connected. If you didn't see that in your assignment, you can try it and see uh, how it works out. We talked about uh, what's called in ODE the axis, but for our purposes, the joint normal, which describes the plane through which the pair of connected objects should rotate. Okay. Okay. So let's get back to collision detection for a moment. As I mentioned, there's collision detection, which we just talked about, and collision resolution. So how does this detection and resolution work in practice? Well, in ODE, it accomplishes it using a callback function. If you have not experienced event-based programming before, this is a bit of a new concept. 
Most of the time when you're writing code, there is a program tracker that is going down one line after the other, and when it hits the bottom of a loop, it jumps to the top and keeps moving through your code and executing your code in lockstep, one line after the other. In event-based programming, there may be other things that are going on on the processor. An event, for example, occurs that grabs the counter, the pointer in your code, and moves it to some new point in the code. So the idea behind event-based programming is actually kind of intuitive. Keep executing my code one line after the other unless this event happens. And if this event ever happens, go to that point in the code and take care of it. And that event is usually something that is external from your code itself. So the moment at which ODE detects a pair of objects that weren't in uh, collision with one another at the previous time step, and now they are, it calls near callback. And you'll notice that when the near callback function is entered, it receives two geoms, which are the two skins that have come into contact with one another. O1 and O2. We are then going to query ODE and get back the bodies that are associated with those geoms. So ODE has detected two skins that have come into contact. We want the bodies associated with these geoms, which are going to store in B1 and B2. And we are now going to ask a few questions about those two bodies. We know those two bodies are in contact, or sorry, we know the two geoms are in contact with one another. If the bodies are connected by a joint, return, leave this callback function. They're supposed to be in contact and overlapping with one another. Ignore that event. There's nothing that you need to do. There's a bunch of other ifs that might cause you to want to ignore the collision event. But if you don't want to avoid the collision event, these are two objects that should not interpenetrate, but that they are. We are going to sprinkle a bunch of points at the point at which they enter the intersect. Okay. Question. So when we define a joint in Aspire's is this the command being or is this end up being queried every time? Every uh, good question. So if you create a joint, is this being queried every time? I think yes, which is somewhat inefficient. And there's ways we could probably rewrite this. But I think, yes, it's detecting every pair of connected objects and then ignoring that collision event at every time step. However efficient, inefficient that is, it's always being swamped by the n times n minus 1 divided by 2 number of collision events. Right? That's, that's taking up most of the time. OK. <coughs> So why sprinkle these points seems like kind of an odd thing to do. It turns out when two three-dimensional objects come into contact with one another, there's lots of different ways they can hit one another. The easiest thing is to have two spheres, which are both moving very, very, very slowly, so that at the point at which they weren't touching and now they are, what can you tell me about the geometry of the collision surface? It's a point, super simple, right? Unfortunately, that rarely happens. It's usually something more complicated. So what ODE will do is actually some relatively complicated stuff to sort of approximate the surface or the volume at which they are in contact and put a bunch of points around that space. If you get down into the guts of ODE, you can specify this var variable max contacts, which is the total number of points ODE will sprinkle into this collision volume. Why would a user want to tinker with this number? Why not just, as you can imagine, if you sprinkle more points, especially if you're sprinkling n times n minus 1 over 2 clouds of points, this is really going to slow things down. Why not just use one point? You, you, it may miss, the point may miss the collision volume because, again, it's hard to approximate, so it might get it wrong. I haven't told you yet what it's going to do with these points, so let me explain that first. That might help. As you can see in the little cartoon here, once it sprinkles these points within the collision volume, each point can query its own position. Where am I? And where are the centers of the two other objects that are colliding? 
And at this point, I'm going to apply one force to that object in the direction towards its center of mass. And I'm also going to apply a force, which are the, the little arrows here, to the other object pointing towards its center of mass, right? So in essence, it's a point that gets caught between two colliding objects and is trying to push them apart. And these points are going to have slightly different positions, so they're going to, they're going to push in slightly different directions. But hopefully, on average, you get forces which are pushing orthogonal to the collision volume. OK. Why not just use one point? Assuming that point even lands in the collision volume. Because it might bounce off in the wrong direction. Might bounce off in the wrong direction, right? The more points you use, the more accurate you're going to simulate what happens when the two objects collide and how they should be pushed apart. This is one of many trade-offs that need to be made in a physics engine, which is that you're always trading speed for accuracy. And how you want to strike that balance depends on what you're trying to do. OK. Obviously, all these details are hidden from you uh, at the level of PyroSim. You'll notice here that when we add one of these points, we're also adding a bunch of additional parameters that, given the names, might give you a hint. They're kind of the way that these things should separate, right? like bounce. Uh, mu1 and mu2 have to do with friction. Imagine you have uh, two spheres that are wrapped in sandpaper, so very high friction. And they don't collide head on, they, cl they collide obliquely, <coughs> right? If they're covered in sandpaper, they should actually roll a little bit because they're, the two sandpaper surfaces catch and actually alter the rotational acceleration of the colliding objects. If they're covered uh, in grease, for example, which would be you can simulate using these other friction parameters, they don't alter their rotational uh, acceleration very much. They slide and bounce off one another. Right? You can really get down into the nitty gritty of simulating different kinds of surfaces. How many textures does PyroSim have? Uh, it's, so by texture, that's just an analogy. So the texture is being approximated using these five parameters. So you can simulate an infinite number of textures if you know how to set the values of these parameters given uh, given your, your surface. Again, there is a whole literature on simulating sandpaper, sand, clay, greases, oils, wood, you name it, it's in there. It gets very complicated very quickly. Again, you're trading speed versus accuracy. Okay. Okay, so uh, at these points, assuming that they are inside the collision uh, volume, we're going to create an additional joint, which sounds strange. This is not a hinge joint like your elbow or your knee. It is, uh, it is a contact joint. And what joints really do hinge joints and contact joints, and so we're going to see prismatic joints. Uh, we're going to see a whole bunch of other joints as we move on. What they really do is they try and restrict the relative motion of pairs of objects. So in the case of a hinge joint, what does it do? It tries to restrict the relative position of the objects. Luckily for us, our elbow joint makes sure that your lower arm doesn't separate from your upper arm. So a hinge joint is trying to restrict the relative position of objects, but not the, it does not restrict the relative rotation of objects. So you can think of joints as, try, as constraints. They're applying forces. Everything is done ultimately by applying forces. It's applying forces to try and alter or restrict certain kinds of relative accelerations. Case of hinge joints, stop relative position, but allow relative rotation. Same thing with contact joints. They're going to restrict, they're going to try and restrict relative uh, changes in relative position, especially redu further reducing the positions between the objects, the difference in positions between the pairs of objects. Make sense? OK. OK, now we get to the fun part. Inside of ODE, there is one master for loop called simulation loop 
And this loop will run 100 times, 1,000 times, 10,000 times. You may have figured out in PyroSim, when you create a simulator, there's a command line argument, which is, I think, evaluation period. And it's, it's, it's an integer. And that integer, I think, by default is 100 or 1,000. I forget what it is at this point. It doesn't matter. That integer tells ODE how many times to loop through sim loop. OK. So what happens through one pass of sim loop? We're assuming at this point we have initiali initialized our scene. We've created all our objects with their initial positions, orientations, masses, geometric properties. We've assigned uh, joints to everything. The simulation is ready to go. We turn it on. We enter sim loop for the first time. And the first thing it does is to see, are there any pairs of objects that are colliding? and assign forces to those objects. Nothing has moved yet. We're just adding forces, if need be, on colliding objects. If the simulation is not paused, we're going to step the world. So in a physics engine, unlike the real world, in a physics engine, time is discrete. So positions update from one time step to the ne next. They are not continuously moving, but like any computer animation, if you watch it, it looks relatively smooth. This world step takes a floating point parameter, which is the time step. And you can also, uh, you can also set that when you create a simulation in PyroSim. So you can specify the number of time steps, which is the number of times through the sim loop, and also the amount of time in seconds that elapse from one time step to the next. So time in physics engines is a little bit strange. It's not wall clock time. Some of you have probably noticed that your simulation seems to be running slower than real time. If you have a pretty good laptop, your simulation looks like it's running faster than real time. In the virtual world, from one frame to the next, from one pass through sim loop to the next, this is how much time in seconds passes. How does that affect the calculation of the new positions and the new orientations. How does that come in? You can imagine that if you have a small time step, and if we place one object in the scene above the ground with a small time step from one time step to the next, it's only going to move a small distance, right? And it's going to slowly come to the ground and then come to a stop. If we set a large time step, there's going to be big jumps from one time step to the next. How is ODE using time information to alter the position and orientation? Where does that come in, given what we've talked about so far about ODE? It determines the forces on the object at different time steps. So it's got to do with the forces, right? So we're back to force equals mass times acceleration. What are the units associated with those three variables? Acceleration, right? Acceleration is meters per second squared, right? So you remember that ODE is computing acceleration given the forces and the masses. So at the moment that it steps the world, it goes through every object, computes all the forces that are acting on all the objects, so now, at this point, ODE has in hand the forces and masses for every object. It computes the accelerations for every object. So now we have accelerations for every object, and it's going to use the acceleration to compute the new position of those objects. But the position could be more or less, depending on how much of the acceleration it adds, which is meters per second squared. So it folds in this number when it's going from acceleration to the new position, right? The bigger this number is, the bigger the change in position. OK. So um, we could set a relatively large time step, which will run our simulation much faster, right? We'll, we'll get more done. There'll be more action for the same number of time steps than if we have the same number of time steps, but a very, very small time step. It's going to take your computer much longer to compute. Why not just use a huge time step and speed things up? 
you lose accuracy, right? If we have one object that's falling towards the ground, if we have a, a large time step, it's going to jump and eventually be under the ground. The collision detection and resolution part of the code is going to go crazy and apply a huge force in the opposite direction because there's a lot of interpenetration and the object is going to come flying up out of the ground like it did in assignment two when you added your first object, right? So we can reduce computation by having a large time step, but we give up accuracy. So we're again trying to strike this balance between accuracy uh, and speed. Do again, doesn't matter for you at the moment, but as you start to create much more complex robots and task environments, you'll find in PyroSim that you're fiddling with this number quite a bit. You want it to be small enough that, you, that things are relatively well behaved in the simulation, but not too small that you're waiting a minute for the robot to take one step in your simulator. Question. Does that mean that if it's too big, if you expect to object to collide, it might skip that collision? It might skip that collision altogether. And again, you can test this in ODE. You can take two very small spheres, two very small bullets, and fire them at a very fast rate at each other. And if the time step is too high, they will pass through one another and keep, keep going, right? Spooky action at a distance. OK. OK, so now uh, at this point in Simuloop, ODE has computed all the new positions and orientations of the objects. It empties the contact group or groups if you have them. So we, could, we throw away the contact joints. So hinge joints and all the other joints that we're going to look at are permanent. They exist for every pass through the sim loop until the simulation, simulation ends, but contact joints are uh, temporary. They only exist from here to here in the loop and then they're thrown away. They may, they may be recreated at the next time step, but they're temporary. Okay. Then if you have the graphics turned on, and you'll find out soon in PyroSim that you can turn the graphics on and off. If the graphics are turned on, it will draw all of the uh, objects for you. So when you have the graphics turned on, there are basically two main events going on, right? Updating of the physics and refreshing of the graphics. Physics, graphics, physics, graphics. You turn off the graphics, the physics is still going. You just don't see it. All good? OK. OK, so that's the basics of ODE. Um, why are you not coding directly in ODE? As I mentioned, we're trying to hide a lot of the details here. Not everyone knows how to program in C++. The other thing that we built into PyroSim is a little bit of the robotics wrapper. This is where the row comes in. ODE itself has no sensors and it has no neurons and synapses. These are elements that are specific to robotics. You can obviously simulate other things in a physics engine other than robots. So how do the sensors work in PyroSim? So you've already created uh, is it touch uh, angle sensors, I think. You're going to do angle sensors, touch sensors. We're going to do proprioceptive, light sensors. We're going to do a whole bunch of sen You can add a whole bunch of simulators, uh, sensors and send them to the physics engine. What's going on under the hood? What's going on under the hood is we're going to simulate these sensors by exploiting all of the machinery that we just talked about. So for example, let's think about touch sensors. Let's imagine that we have this little quadruped robot that we're looking at from the side. And at this particular time step, the front leg is, the, is off the ground. So the touch sensor in the front leg is not firing. But the touch sensor in the back leg, which is in contact with the ground, is firing. How do we know that? We know that because at this particular time step, near callback was called. And it was called between object two and the floor. The floor itself is an object. So near callback says these two objects are in collision with one another. And we added some additional code to say, and if either of those two objects has a touch sensor inside, ODE sets the value of that touch sensor to one. Otherwise, all the other touch sensors are quiet. So we're, we're exploiting the contact detection part of ODE to set the values of any touch sensors you send to the simulation. OK. I won't reveal it, but in the next slide at the bottom, we're going to place a light sensor in the center of the robot's body. 
and we're going to tra treat this external object as a light source. So we're going to assume that this object is emitting a light, and there is a light sensor in here which is detecting light intensity, like you saw when we talked about the Breitenberg vehicles. Given what we just talked about in terms of ODE, how might you simulate a light sensor? How might you set the value of a light sensor to the amount of light intensity? It's a little bit trickier than the touch sensor. We will make things simpler. Let's imagine that the light sensor is sitting on top of the back of this robot, and there's no occlusion, there's no shadows. It's a bit of a hack, but for now, let's, let's start with that. How might we simulate a touch sensor? For a light sensor, you could just get the distance. And let's get the distance. Let's get, let's get the distance, right? ODE knows at every time step the position of at least the center of the object. So we might have to add a little bit. We might have to do a little bit of geometry if we want to connect, compute the position of a, t of a light sensor on the top of the robot's back, but that's fine. We also know the position of this light, uh, of, this, of this light, can take the distance between these. We can compute the Euclidean distance. And on this slide here, we're taking one over one plus the Euclidean distance, which is actually also not quite correct. Any physics majors here? There's something known as the inverse square law which says if there is a light source in your environment, the amount of light that you are detecting from that light source falls off inversely, meaning the greater the distance, the less light I'm detecting, falls off inversely, not proportionally with my distance to the light source, but squared, right? You can imagine that light source, there is a ball of photons going out from there, and they are becoming less and less uh, uh, they're becoming more diffuse the further away you move. So this should actually be 1 over 1 plus Euclidean distance squared. Again, this doesn't take into account shadows. So we could also imagine adding some more machinery to detect whether there are any objects between this object and this object. It gets complicated, but for our purposes, this is basically what's going on under the, the hood. right? When you get to the sensors assignment, you'll see you'll be implementing lots of different other kinds of sensors. It's interesting to test your intuition about physics engines to think how, what parts of the physics engine might you exploit to simulate that sensor. Okay, so remember there are always six parts uh, when we're simulating a robot in a physics engine, objects, joints, sensors, motors, neurons and synapses, we just did sensors, so we're moving on to the fourth component, motors. How does the robot move in a physics engine? The way this works in ODE is we're going to start to set additional parameters on the hinge. When you create a default uh, hinge joint, it's passive, meaning that all of the forces that are acting on the two objects, they will pull in, those forces will pull and push on the objects, and the joint won't resist except to make sure that they don't come apart. Everything else the joint will respect, so you get what's known as ragdoll physics, right? The, the thing will just sort of fall to the ground. Once we start to, at, at, in PyroSim, the moment you add a motor to uh, a, a hinge joint, now it's no longer a ragdoll. The motor, as you might expect, is going to add additional, an additional force it's not going to add a force to the joint because the joint doesn't, isn't a physical thing. It's going to apply forces to the pairs of objects attached by that joint. Right? Intuitively, it's easier to, easier to think about a motorized joint and the joint is pulling and pushing on its pair of objects. But strictly speaking in the physics engine, a motor is associated with a joint, but the motor is going to apply forces to the objects. Okay, how does it do that? Well, we set a number of parameters like the maximum force of the motor, so you can make weaker or stronger motors. We are then going to tell the motor that there is a desired angle, and I find it easier to think in degrees rather than radians. It's actually in radians, but we'll do this in degrees. We, do, we set a desired uh, angle, 
which in this cartoon example is 60 degrees, and we're going to apply it to the joint that connects the front leg here to the main body. When we start to think about uh, the angles of joints, we're going to use a particular uh, convention here, which is when you take two objects and you attach them by a joint in, in the first time step of the simulation, the angle of that joint is zero which is non-intuitive because if I asked you what this angle was, most of you would say 90 degrees. Zero means the initial angle between the pair of objects. If I attach two objects with a joint like this, the angle is zero. If I attach two objects like this, the angle is zero. Like this, the angle is zero. And any, uh, any deflection away from that is going to be a positive angle or a negative angle. And the convention we're going to use is flexion, meaning objects moving towards the center of the connected objects. If you flex inward, we're going to assume that that is a negative number. Pull the objects inward. And extension, anything where the objects are trying to rotate away from the connected objects, is a positive number. Now, you are not going to set these angles manually. It's going to be the neural network that spits out these angles. So you're not actually going to see these angles in the assignments. But just for our purposes of discussion, negative numbers pulling inward, positive numbers pushing outward. OK, so at this point in the simulation, we are assuming we're sending to ODE this number. We want this joint, which is currently at 0. We're going to assume this is the default angle out to 60 degrees, out here. OK. What does ODE do with that information? It computes the actual angle at the moment, which is 0, and then takes the difference between them. 60 minus 0 is 60. So there is a difference between the actual angle and the desired angle. And we are going to apply a force that's proportional to that difference. It actually is represented here as a velocity. So in ODE, there's an additional step, which is we're taking the difference between the desired and actual angle. We're telling, uh, we're telling, the, we're telling ODE that we want a desired velocity of 60, rotate uh, at six, a velocity of 60 to try and get there. And then ODE takes that velocity and turns it into a force. Okay. Easier for us to just think about going directly from difference to force. What would happen if I set the desired angle to zero? What would be the force that would be, we'd be that ODE would be applying to the pair of objects? Nothing, right? Zero. It's what we want, so do nothing. Don't add any additional forces. OK. Last detail I'm going to introduce here is when I say forces here, I'm actually talking in this case about torques. And torque is just a fancy word for rotational velocity. Uh, sorry, rotational force. So I can apply a force that pushes an object away from me, or I can apply a force that tries to rotate an object, right? If you're opening a bottle cap, you're applying force, but you're applying rotational force that's torque. If you're pushing on the bottle as a whole, that's linear force. Yeah? OK, so I'm not going to distinguish between linear and rotational force. For our purposes, ODE just applies a bunch of forces, some of them linear, some of them rotational. As you can imagine, if we have two objects connected by a hinge joint, we're talking about rotational forces. It's trying to rotate the objects away from one another or towards one another. So far, so good? OK. Now, so what happens? We have now gone all the way from a desired angle to forces. We take another step, or ODE takes another step through sim loop. Yep? Sorry, when you yep. said that the forces are torque, that's just for motors. Just for the motors. But remember that the motors are not a, they're an abstraction in the code. They're, they're a short form for going from desired angle to torques. Uh, it can be both. So depending on how a pair of objects collides, there can be a combination of linear and rotational forces that act on those objects. 
Remember our discussion about the sandpaper versus the greased ball bearings? It depends, it depends. When we're talking about this, motors acting on hinge joints, it's only torques. Okay, just the detail. Okay, so you can imagine though that from time step uh, t here to t plus one, the, the leg doesn't go from zero to 60 immediately. It only moves a little bit. So remember that the desired angle is not us telling the physics engine, I want the objects to be rotated by 60 degrees at the next time step. It's this number triggering the application of a force, which is turned into an acceleration. So the front leg starts accelerating away from the center of the body, yeah? In this cartoon example here, it only gets 20 degrees out, depending on the time step. If we set a small time step, it might only be one degree away or a tenth of a degree. In our cartoon example here, it gets to 20 degrees away. So we now have the angle between this object and this object being 20. Remember, we started with zero and we only got to change to 20. What happens if I now ask, what happens if I now keep the desired angle the same at the next time step? I still say we want this thing to eventually get to 60 degrees. Tell me about the forces. What are the forces that are gonna act the next time step? Are the forces the same, stronger, weaker? They're smaller, they're weaker because the difference is less. 60 minus 20 is 40, and that 40 is going through velocity into forces. So the amount of torque that's applied is going to be less. So I'm showing you two frames in this animation here, and you can now run the rest of this animation in your head. You can imagine the front leg accelerating quickly and then slowing down as it approaches 60 and then comes to a stop. Yeah, that's what you would see in this simplified example. So far, so good. Question? Yeah. Um, so is there, what in Pyrosim is saying, like, okay, once it's at 60, is there something that like, can lock it in place? Ah. Like, what's going to prevent it from just swinging back down? Good question, right? So it may accelerate towards 60, slow down and reach 60, but overshoot 60. So now let's say the actual angle is 70, but the desired angle is still 60. What happens in that case? It's overshot the desired angle. What forces are applied now? Force. Forces in the opposite direction, right? So 60 minus 70 is minus 10. It's gonna apply rotational force in the other direction. You absolutely, it's going to cause it to vibrate. And you can play around with that in ODE by create connecting pairs of objects with a joint. Actually, you can take your scissor bot, make the time step high. So we're going to make things inaccurate, make a very strong motor. And we'll talk about how you can do this. You're going to send numbers to the, to the motor and you will definitely see it start to vibrate. That is a, the worst nightmare for engineers. This happens in not just robots, but all kinds of machines. So how strong should the motor be? Should we change this number? Maybe we should pick this number more carefully. Maybe we should damp the motor. So it's not just slowing down as it approaches the target object in a linear way. We do it in a nonlinear way. There's a whole field in engineering about control theory, which is how to do this right so that we minimize Vibrations. Uh, not this type of joint, the hinge joint, but the other joint that's called. Uh, uh, there's a whole bunch of other ones we're going to look at. The easiest one to. It, talking about a second that keeps two other the joints. contact joint. Contact joint. Yep. Is there an adhesion level to that? So if I put two motors in the opposite direction, I can see the. There's the no point. motors associated with contact joints. So I'm right? saying if I have an object so oh. with a contact joint in the middle and I have two motors pointing away from each other on the other end, can I see the force it would take to rip that joint apart? Like, could I make an earth and a space shuttle and see like the force that we need to get rid of it or rip that's, a piece of paper apart? Uh, that's a good question. So you have two objects and they are not connected by a hinge joint, you're saying? They're two separate contact objects? Joint, yeah. uh, yes, but the contact joint will only apply when the space shuttle is on the ground. The moment it leaves, there's no joints connecting these pairs of objects. There's no motor, it's all gravity and, and momentum at that point. 
or something that's trying to hold it together. I don't know. We'd have to think about that a little bit. So do the joints for the objects have like a potential strength that would that you could simulate damage to robots? Ah, uh, you not in PyroSim. I think we covered that over. You can obviously download ODE and work with it directly if you want, and you can start to do some of these more sophisticated things, like specify a temporary joint, a temporary hinge joint that will disappear if the torques acting on the objects ever pass some threshold, right? The joint snaps and the two objects come apart. You can simulate that in ODE, not in, not in Pyrosum. Okay, any other questions before we move on? Okay, so we've got objects, joints, sensors, motors nailed down. Let's talk about neurons and synapses. Where does this 60 come from? Where does the desired angle come from? Well, if you remember our discussion from last week, the output layer of the neural network, which in this little cartoon example here, there's just one output neuron in the output layer. The value arriving at that output neuron is interpreted by ODE as the desired angle. You, you haven't got there yet, but when you do, you can, one of the things that you can send from PyroSim to ODE is a motor neuron. So you can specify a neuron and say that's a motor neuron. That neuron is attached to that motor that I already sent to the simulator. And so now at every time step of the simulation, we're gonna update the physics of the physics engine. If the graphics are turned on, we're gonna update the graphics. And we're also going to update the neural network. We're gonna compute the values of the sensors and pass them to the input layer, propagate them from the input layer to the output layer, as Josh Powers described to you last week. And then the values at the output neuron if any, at the output layer, if any of those are motor neurons, we take the values from those motor neurons, send them to the motor, and that number is translated into torques that apply to the pair of for objects connected by that joint. So we're going all the way from the virtual world to the virtual sensors, to the input layer, to the output layer, to the motors, to the forces which cause the robot to move, which at the next pass through sim loop causes the sensor values to change because the robot has moved, its relative orientation and position to the world has changed, and around and around we go. So with this slide, we've now completed this loop from pushing against the world and observing how the world pushes back. The robot acts and senses the repercussions of its actions. So far so good? Okay. All right, so let's look at this little cartoon example here. We again have our little cartoon uh, quadruped and forget about the other two legs. We just have one front leg and one back leg. The front and the back leg each have a touch sensor and that's it. We have two, two sensors. So we have two input neurons, T1 and T2. At this first time step of the simulation, we have created the legs to be in contact with the ground. So the minute we start up the physics engine, both touch sensors fire and they report a value of one. We take those two ones and we embed them in the input layer. We propagate those values down through the two synapses to the motor here. And let's assume for the moment the value arriving at the motor neuron is 60 which is interpreted as a desired angle of 60, as we just saw in the previous slide. So those forces cause the front leg to rotate forward. And at the next time step, at the moment that it does, the leg comes off the ground, which means T2 stops firing, which means the values at the input layer also change, right? Okay, this is very different from what you may have seen before in neural networks where we, the humans, are feeding in images or YouTube videos or whatever it is. We are feeding them into the input layer. The moment we embed a neural network in a robot, the robot, through its own actions, is generating the, its own data at the input layer. It's a big, big difference, which we'll come back to many times in this course. Okay, so the values at the input layers have changed. Assuming there's no change to the synaptic weights, um, in this case, we get a new value, 
because we have new values at the input layer. In this case, let's assume the value is minus 90. What's going to happen at the next time step? The leg is going to start coming back, right? Because we're asking for uh, uh, flexion, pull inward towards the body. <coughs> it's going to start accelerating back. What's going to happen at the next time step? The front leg is rotating inward and back down. What's going to happen eventually? It's going to hit the ground, in which case we go back to this which means it's going to extend and you're going to get motion, right? Some of you may have already seen this in the, the simple scissor bot. This is basically what's, what's happening. So in this neural network, there is nothing that says extend and flex your leg at this frequency. There is none of that in here. It is emerging, that frequency, whatever it is, that repeated motion, there's no clock, there's no frequency, there's no timer. It's emerging from this feedback loop with the world. This is the simplest example you're going to see of why a lot of people in AI care so much about robots and the physical body. This physical body is giving us something, which in this case is something useful, an oscillation that causes the robot to move. Very simply, we have two synapses. Assuming we've set the weights of those synapses correctly, we can get away with a very, very simple controller, and we don't need all the additional material of a timer, or if you remember Valentino Breitenberg's fruit fly, we don't need differential calculus. This robot doesn't need to make a model of its world and look at the floor and decide the rate at which it's going to step. None of that. It's the interaction of the body with the world that's giving rise to the behavior. Okay, the question, the million dollar question, maybe the billion dollar question robotics is how do you pick the synaptic weights to get the behavior you want? That is not so easy. In this example, it made it a little bit easier on you. So just to refresh your intuition about neural networks, what are these two synaptic weights? Let's assume we have no activation function. Remember the activation function is the thing that takes the raw sum, this times this, plus this times this, and then squashes it to some value, let's, for, let's assume there is no activation function for now. What are the two weights here? And if you know, how did you figure it out? Remember that the weights are the same in both cases. This is the same neural network. It's not changing. The weights are not changing. The only thing that's changing are the neuron values. So what are the weights that would produce 60 if we have 1, 1, and minus 90 if we have 1, 0? It's almost as simple as the XOR function here. Well, we know that the is going to be you know that this weight has to be, minus it has to be minus 90, right? Because it's got to be 1 times x plus 0. Has to equal 90. So 1 times x equals minus 90 means x is minus 90. So this weight is minus 90. What's the other weight? 150, right? OK. Kind of v weird weights for our synapse, but, but there you go. Right? OK, that's the idea. OK, that concludes our discussion about physics engines and uh, the tools of the trade. Any questions before we move on to our new section on the history of evolutionary robotics? All good? OK, so let's go all the way back to 1996, the year in which the very first evolutionary robotics experiment uh, was published. We're going to look at two experiments in this lecture. We'll just start on the first one today. Uh, both published uh, in about the same year. There's a little bit of argument about who was first, of course, in academia. But the sort of these two simultaneous studies were, were both interesting in their own right. Um, it's called the Italian pro approach uh, because it was actually carried out by Italian researchers in Switzerland. Not important for our purposes, but anyways. In the literature, it's known as the Italian approach. What did they do? Um, they took this very sophisticated robot called the Kepra uh, robot. It's about the size of a hockey puck. As you can see, it's got two wheels. 
And the nice thing about the Kepra, and you can actually, there's still versions of it you can buy to this day, uh, it's modular. You can stack additional layers on top that give you additional sensors and motors, like, for example, this little gripper here, which is picking up a little sugar cube. Okay, so <clears throat> nice thing about a hockey puck sized robot is obviously you can perform experiments on a tabletop and, and observe uh, what happens. Okay, another extension that you can add is not a camera. Um, this is a, a linear vision model uh, module. What do I mean by that? It's basically 64 light sensors on the front of the robot pointed more or less like our field of view. So whatever that is, 120, 140 uh, degrees in front. So at every time step inside the robot's controller, it gets back 64 numbers. The bigger that number, the more light that's falling on that, uh, on that particular photo sensor. So if our little Kepra is looking at a white, uh, a white, a white wall and there's a black bar there, it will see a little bit of dip in the light sensors. If it's looking out into the world and there's an obstacle in front of it that darkens its field of view, that will also drop by a little bit. So no camera here. It can't see colors and shapes, or maybe it can see shapes. It doesn't see much, just sort of relative light levels. Very, very simple creature. What they did is to take this Kepra put it on a tabletop, and again, this is 1996, so not, not really any wireless technology at that time. They tethered the robot to the computer. The computer is gonna run the evolutionary algorithm, and the robot is gonna carry out the behavior given some set of synaptic weights that are encoded by the evolutionary algorithm. It's actually not that different from what you're doing in your assignments, where you're eventually building up an evolutionary algorithm that calls PyroSim and evaluates a robot in simulation rather than a physical robot on a table. So evolution on the computer and the neural network updates the movement of the robot on the tabletop. Okay, then a little uh, laser emitting device that would uh, shine down into the workspace that they could use to detect the position and orientation uh, of the robot. And that information was passed into the robot. So the robot knew, thanks to the laser, its XY position on the table. It could only move in 2D, so only X and Y. And it's heading alpha. I'm at X equals three, Y equals two, and I'm I've got an alpha of 90 degrees, whatever it is. Has those three pieces of information available. Okay, assuming that we took those three numbers and fed them into the little robot's neural network and then it rotated its wheels based on those three numbers and the sets of synaptic weights, what kinds of behaviors could we evolve for this robot? Not much, obviously, but what could we do? If you had this set up at home, what kinds of fitness functions might you make? What would you select? What would you put into your evolutionary algorithm to evolve the robot to do? Object avoidance, right? You can see in the little cartoon here, they put a little bit of ob obstacles, so don't, don't hit the obstacles. I'm sorry, it has X, Y, and alpha, and also it's receiving these 64 numbers, right? So it can see a little bit and knows a little bit about its position and orientation. Well, what uh, Floriano and Mondada did was to build this little maze you see bottom left here. And they took those 64 numbers and they, put, uh, they did a little bit of hacking to this robot so that the robot could actually see, uh, it had six photo sensors on its front. So they combined some of these numbers to make a more accurate reading. So the robot had six readings of light intensity in front of it, and also two readings from behind. They put another one on there so it could see behind. So we have eight sensors. And in this experiment, they're gonna, the robot is not going to have X, Y, and alpha. But the evolutionary algorithm is. So the evolutionary algorithm is going to know the position and orientation of the robot, but the robot is only going to know these eight uh, light intensity readings. 
You're going to feed these in to the two motor neurons. So they're actually drawing the neural network on the body of the robot. And those two motor neurons are sending values to the left wheel and the right wheel. So this is actually not that much more complicated than a Breitenberg vehicle, where we had two sensors and two motors. In this case, we have eight sensors and two motors. As you can imagine, they're going to try and evolve this robot to circle, to lap the maze, go around the maze as many times uh, as possible, and don't collide with the wheels. OK. The values that are arriving at the motors, they're going to squash that with an activation function. You're going to squash it to the range minus 0.5 to 0.5. So 5 means rotate the wheel forward as quickly as possible, minus five, rotate it backwards as quickly as possible, zero means hold the wheel still, and any value in between that is faster or slower, backwards or forwards. We're gonna assume that these eight uh, incoming input values range between zero and one. Zero if that light sensor can't see anything in front of it, and one if there's, it's black, there's something right up in front of me blocking the rest of the light in the room. So you can think of an obstacle from the point of view of the robot as just something that is blocking light. The closer the obstacle, the more light that it's blocking. Okay, we'll end with this slide. We have to create a fitness function, phi here, and this fitness function is going to, uh, it's going to compute, we're going to use these 10 different variables to build up this fitness function. The first two are the speed of the left and the right wheel. And I1 and I8 are the values of the proximity sensors. So we're going to have to use this to kind of estimate how the robot is doing at going around and around the, the maze. As I mentioned, the researchers could cheat and use the X and Y and alpha from the laser. In this case, they tried to keep things simple and they wanted to just use these 10 numbers, which the robot also has. We want the robot to go through the maze as quickly as possible. We don't want it to spin in place. We don't want it to crash into obstacles. So a couple of things we want and a couple of things we don't want. We need to plug these things in so that if we get any of the things we don't want, phi is close to one, zero. And if we're getting mostly what we want, phi is close to one. If we're getting mediocre behavior, phi should give us back a value of 0.5 and so on. See if you can write down a function for phi as a function of, write down phi as a function of these 10 variables. See how you did next time. You have a quiz due tonight and you're working on various assignments. I'll see you on Tuesday. Thanks very much.